Hello, this is Alex Burkett. I am the co-founder of Omniscient Digital, a premium content marketing agency, and the host of this podcast, The Long Game Podcast, which you're listening to. In this episode, I'm talking to Dan Schur. This is one of those episodes where I planned an hour and a half for the conversation, but I would have loved three hours or more. Dan is the owner of Evolving SEO, a boutique SEO consultancy, and he also hosts the popular SEO podcast, Experts on the Wire. Why should you listen to this episode? Well, first off, Dan uh, gives a massive amount of tac tactical, actionable, truly actionable information on SEO strategy. Uh, down to the level of like writing an individual blog post, actually, he gives tips on like language to use, how to structure it, crazy detailed. He's got several contrarian takes as well, such as the problems with the pillar and cluster model, uh, why he tries to tune out the constant noise of too many trends and frameworks and new things and algorithm changes constantly cropping up in the SEO space, and why he won't ask people to share his content. Second, Dan and I share a background and love of music, and this framework proves to be really interesting for problem solving in the digital marketing space as well. Finally, Dan is just a great conversationalist and clearly a deep thinker. He tells me how he uses uh, several mental models, but one in particular, the 80-20 principle to structure his content strategy and production work, what lurking changes may be ahead for Google and the search engine results page and how that may affect both viewers and searchers, as well as brands uh, trying to make it in the SERPs, and much, much more. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Dan Schur. I wanted to start with the question because this is the rare opportunity because you also have a podcast and quite a popular one. And I find it interesting that most marketing podcasts tend to do short form, very tactical stuff. But you you have also chosen a longer format interview style for your podcasts. Um, was that deliberate? And what values, what value do you think that gave you um, to explore different ideas and maybe what cons are associated with that long form as well? Yeah, it's funny. It was not deliberate. It's because I'm very long winded and I, I like getting into in depth discussions with people. I have a very hard time doing like surface level, quick question, okay, move on, quick question, move on. I struggle with that style a lot. Like I want to ask the follow up. So I want to get the details. I want to get every little thing from the person I'm talking to about their tactic. And I think a lot of it has to do with SEO as well, right? It's like, very hard to just surface level talk about a strategy or a campaign that was done or a technique or how Googlebot crawls the website or something like that. So that's, it wasn't a conscious choice. Or it's not like I sat down and I was like, oh, what's going to make the best podcast? Let me just do long form because I think that's going to get the most downloads or whatever. It was really like what suits the content format or suits the topic and my style the best, right? Um, so no, it was not a conscious decision at all, but I think it's worked out because a lot of other SEO podcasts are that more short for form style, which I don't really like for that kind of topic. And I think it has helped set my podcast apart a little bit. Uh, it's hard though, to keep up a long form show, right? As I'm sure you've experienced as well at times. So I think it can, if it can be done and done well, it's definitely a competitive advantage for sure. Yeah, it feels so as a, as a listener, I, I think there's like horses for courses. I think that's an English saying, right? Uh, different yeah. things for different people. Um, I like long form. I like to put it on in the background as I'm driving or commuting or doing my dishes or whatever. I think some people may prefer the tactic, the short, short form stuff. But yeah. as a listener, I realized I'm like, well, this is what I like listening to. So that's why we chose that. And I think mm -hmm. similar to you, I like rambling and I like going on tangents. And sometimes yeah. maybe you've noticed this. I think that a conversation is going to go a certain direction. And yeah. then through the course of a long form, you end up being surprised by what you learn. Something comes up that you never could have planned for. So I, I find that's right. to be true uh, as well with that form. Yeah, you have to give things space to, to, to find. Sometimes you need to find your footing with a certain person as well. Like there's people I've had on my show where like we instantly connect. Like I never talked to them before. And there's an instant rapport there, right? Like so Carrie Jones, she's somebody that comes to mind. I interviewed her years ago about a, a a link PR strategy thing they did over at Fractal. And like her and I, we did two episodes together. We hit it off right away, but there's other people, Bill Slosky, for example, well-known in the SEO space for looking at Google patents. I interviewed him twice, but the first hour with him was tricky because he and I have very different talking pace and timing. And 
he thinks very like deliberately. So he doesn't answer things right away. So um, it takes a little while to find your conversational pace with people. And so that's another good reason for long form, right? Because if, yeah, if we cut something off artificially at 30 minutes, you might miss a really, really important point. That would Every time I do these interviews, I swear, like the, the last 10 minutes, I'm like, man, this is the topic I wanted to spend the next two hours on, but we're already there. So right. even in a long form conversation, I still find that to be true. So I can't imagine a 20 minute conversation like, hey, let's get to it right now. Do you right. do you send questions to the guests before they come on or how do you prep them for something like this? Uh, I usually don't send questions. I like to find that balance between having a natural conversation, but also it depends on the guest. So I've had some guests where literally they've never spoken. They've never been on a podcast. It's literally their first time in front of people. And I'd like to give people that kind of first shot at things, especially when they're a really good practitioner, but they just haven't talked about what they do a whole lot. And I love finding those certain people. Um, But so for them, I know they need a little bit more preparation or just feeling ready or an encouragement. So I might do a prep call with some people Mm. like on a rare occasion where we actually talk through what they want to talk about. I try not to give questions. I try to just give bullets of talking points and even just keep those broad because I find that if people, the weird thing that happens is when people know what's coming, they'll like just start answering your question before you asked it. And then it throws off the entire flow of everything And then I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay. So they answer that. Should I still like sort of ask this? You're like, what do you do? Right. So then it just throws off the pace of things. So I usually just try like bullet points um, Mm. at most. Yeah. How about you? Uh, We don't send over talking points. So I'll usually do something like, hey, we'll probably talk about, you know, agency growth with you. We'll probably talk about SEO. I think some of the topics we kind of know we'll cover, but I, I probably cater toward, like I probably under index on preparation and that may be a fault. But I find that um, it allows for more spontaneous and sometimes honest answers. Um, One thing I learned, so I took an improv class uh, four or five years ago. It was one of the scariest things I've I've done. And um, it made me realize how often I and almost everybody plans their answers in their head or like their kind of what they want to say. Even as you're listening to somebody in the course of a normal conversation, you're often thinking about like, oh, what am I going to say to this? But in improv, that was like the biggest fault line uh, Mm -hmm. because they would do exercises where essentially um, the sequencing would change so rapidly that if you planned to say something 10 seconds ago, that plan was over by the time it got to your turn. So it kind of taught you to be more in the moment and more honest. And, you know, those were the funniest things you said were when you were just kind of blurting out what was directly kind of in front of you. So I I tend to under index on it. but I, I worry sometimes that people, especially who haven't done podcasts before, um, you know, maybe that's intimidating to them. Yeah, I think it is intimidating to a lot of people. But if so, one skill as you as a host, right, is learning to, to meet somebody where they're at. So like I've had a few guests in my show where I know I could my job is to get out of their way because they're so good. Like I could say one thing and they're off and running and they could talk and it's interesting for like a half an hour. Right. But there's some guests where you need to like pull them along with you a little bit. And that's where um, it might be more intimidating for them. But if you are a good host where you understand the people that need a little bit of pulling and encouragement versus those that don't, then you can, you can make up for any gaps and where they're intimidated basically. So I do think it's intimidating, but I think if, if you can pull it off well and make the guests feel comfortable, I still think that's a better show than the one that's totally planned out. Totally agree. So do you have any um, lessons learned, secrets, tips in terms of like pulling those lessons out of people who may be, you know, less comfortable freewheeling, um, especially a practitioner? Because I love that idea of finding people who's it's, it's their first time talking in front of a crowd because there's so much insight uh, buried in, in those people as practitioners, frontline people. How do you how do you make them feel comfortable and draw those lessons out? So, okay. Those are two different things. So how I get the lessons out is I state something that I know they're going to disagree with. I love that. Yeah. So it's like, if I ask you, oh, tell me about how this thing works or whatever, like that might not be as motivating or like inspiring for you as a guest. But if I'm like, yeah, I don't really think Google operates that way. Like I think they do X, Y, and Z, and I know they're going to have a contrary point. Then they're going to want to like debate that with me. Right. So I love that bringing somebody into a debate is a very powerful way of doing that. All of the best interviewers 
do that very skillfully, but the danger is making sure you don't, that they don't feel insulted by that, right? That it's a healthy, hey, just playing de- devil's advocate here, right? Like, so what if this and this? So you have to do it in a way where they don't feel like you're just putting them on the spot, right? Making people feel comfortable, I find, is a lot more to do with my demeanor, body language, tone of voice, uh, being on video. I encourage all my guests to like turn their video on and like say hi and like so we can see each other. Um, yeah, so I think uh, comfortable is very much like my demeanor, but getting people to say things is like healthy debating is a good thing too. I love that. Yeah. Have you experimented with different formats? Like, have you done live in-person podcasts versus video versus no video? Yeah. Um, I used to record all my podcast episodes as if they were live. I even like punched in the intro music would like record everything live because that really sped up my production process when I was doing that. Well, then COVID hit, I dismantled my recording setup here at my office and like it got all messed up. Um, but I've even recorded a live episode live on stage at Tech SEO Boost um, a couple of years ago, again, during live events. And that was a panel, right? So that was interesting. So I prepped an hour of questions about analytics for a whole panel. And um, that was weird. That was definitely uh, threw me off of my normal comfort zone and flow quite a bit. Um, I haven't done a whole lot where there's a lot of editing. I've done a little bit like that done a little bit of some experimental episodes. Like I did an episode years ago, actually about conversion Excel called Mm. email. And um, they had a problem with their website, with their Google rankings at the time they lost the Google rankings. And I did this thing where I, I like in my consulting work for CXL, I realized they were getting penalized because they had big headshot pictures in the sidebar Mm, promoting courses that had nothing to do with the blog post that you were currently on. Right. So um, basically, anyways, I created this 15 minute podcast episode where I recorded the sound of thunder outside my office, where I recorded sound effects. And I told more of a first person, you know, single person soliloquy, essentially, like a story. And that became a podcast episode, but I did it more like a like you'd hear on a storytelling podcast or something, right? So there's been a few like little experimental episodes like that here or there, but the production time is really intensive for stuff like that, right? Maybe you've experienced that too. I don't know if you do your own editing or you have people do that sort of thing, but uh, the guys from Radio Lab they always say like, anytime you introduce editing to a podcast, you can triple the amount of time it's going to take you to produce that podcast minimum, bare minimum. Right. Yeah. So we, we deliberately avoided that because of that reason, right? Like we, the way the podcast works for us is it's basically the minimum viable effort on my part. Um, in terms of like, I almost just get in front of the microphone and talk, Uh, whether we're doing like a kitchen side episode, which is like me and the co-founders talking behind the scenes about different strategies and, and kind of how we think about problems in content marketing or in interviews like this. And then it just goes off. Um, our content growth marketer um, handles all of the paperwork and coordination with our editor. Uh, we've got the the theme song done for us. We've got the artwork done for us. Everything's basically distributed and automated. And I don't see most of it, but that's that's like the opposite of what you do, right? I, I think I listened to a, a podcast interview where you were talking about how you do all of the mixing, all of the editing, all of the recording, yeah. all of that stuff. I do. Yeah. It's like almost entirely me at this point. So um, when we had an employee, he would do at least the page on the website and show notes and stuff like that. Then we, we, we downgraded. I don't have an employee any longer, but my wife usually does that stuff. And it's probably why I have barely done any episodes this entire year because client work has been so busy, you know, and if I'm the person that literally produces a hundred percent of my podcast, then if I'm not available to do it, that's what happens. Right. But yeah, I do. So I'm also a musician, right? So I do all the audio production, um, you know, editing, I get pretty crazy and, and nerd out a lot about like EQ and compression and all the audio stuff. Right. So, um, it takes me probably a little longer than it should. Cause I, I sort of have a lot of fun with that, but I, I really want to make all my guests in the show sound really good. And I've, gotten a lot of comments from people that, you know, have said to me, like, you've got some of the best audio quality we've heard on like an SEO podcast. I mean, 
even now I'll go listen to some of the new SEO podcasts that come out and I have to cringe, right? At some of the audio that I'm hearing just because it's so, it's like quiet or there's stuff in the background or, you know, so I take a lot of pride in the audio editing for sure, but it does take a lot of time. So. I mean, it's important though. I've, I've heard, and I guess I can also resonate as a viewer. If this is more so for video, but like on YouTube, if you want to invest your money in something, it should be quality microphones and quality audio equipment because yeah. people will forgive poor image quality and video quality, but they won't forgive poor audio quality. That's and right. I find that to be true. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. I think, um, I forget if, so there's a really great YouTube channel called this guy edits. Mm -hmm. And so for anybody interested in digital content, like just production and the sort of creativity side of it, it's a really great channel. Like he breaks down all the good editing and bad editing qualities of like movies and stuff like that. But I believe on his channel, he, he has a phrase where it's like, you see what you hear. Hmm. Right. And so even in video content, audio is actually way more impactful than anybody realizes even in a video first format right so like your point about like just how the audio quality should be really good is is super important right so like next time anybody is sort of watching their favorite movie or tv show pay attention to how much the audio is impacting what you see it's really crazy but it's yeah fun. Yeah, for sure. So there, there's a clear tie in with your background as a musician here. So can you tell me about your background as a oh, musician? Yeah. Great segue too, by the way. Um, yeah. So, I mean, music, just for context for everyone, uh, music I've done since I'm like five, right? So like went to college for music, did it professionally for 10 years and I've been doing SEO now for like 10 years, right? So but music was my first career. It's what I went to school for. Um, I've played in many bands before, right? So like, it's just a strong part of my identity. I still create music all the time at home. I play the piano. I do, I produce like hip hop beats and stuff like that. So it's still very much a part of who I am, but it definitely obviously directly contributed to my podcast through the production and like the theme music is my own music and my podcast. But I'd say too, like, and if you want to, if you want to segue to SEO at some point too or even business, being a musician and practicing music has very much strongly impacted how I approach SEO and how I approach just like marketing and business as well in many ways, right? And we could talk about all of those. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing music gets you to do among many is see the big picture and the small picture at the same time. And it's like very equivalent to, let's say I'm playing a song. I know why the note D, I know why it's important like individually, but I also know why it's important in the entire song, right? It has mm -hmm. context. A D is very different if you're in the key of D versus if you're in the key of A. Right. It's like a totally different, it'll sound different. It has a different meaning. It's a different character, if you will, like in that song. And that's why I think a lot of people struggle in the world of SEO when it comes down to something like, let's take link building, right? Like, you need to be able to think of like why link building might matter, like in that micro like environment, if you will. But also you need to simultaneously think about why does link building matter or not matter in the bigger picture of things. So it's that it's literally, I think, like a brain skill to be able to think big picture and small picture at the same time and hold both of those thoughts in your brain and understand the impacts on a big level and a small level at the same time. Yeah, it's very important for thinking strategically and mechanically and that type of thing. And that's one thing I think if you have a musical brain and you've learned to play an instrument and you were talking about improv too, right? Like mm -hmm. if you've learned to sort of think in real time, all of those things impact how you do something like SEO for sure. We could talk about a lot of those impacts, but that's one yeah. thing. We're going to... I'm going to um, pause on the music thing. It might frustrate the audience. We're going to get to SEO eventually, but um, so you can see here, I've got some guitars in the background too. Yep. Um, so we share that music background and I've, I've found a pattern um, from going to all these conferences, especially among growth. And I guess growth is such a broad term, um, but especially in areas of marketing where you sort of combine like a quantitative and creative component. I've found yes. that a lot of people come from music backgrounds. I know Pep used to 
sing in a band. I, I know Chanel, uh, my coworker at CXL, she plays the bass and songwrites. So I do yep. see a, a commonality um, in this field. I don't know if, you, if you've seen the same pattern, um, at least loosely. Yeah, so many musicians. Um, and I don't know if that's like, what's that like thing when you start noticing the same car everywhere, right? There's like a word for that. Um, maybe it's that, maybe I just, maybe we just both It's notice. like an av- availability bias of sorts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe it's just easy to notice musicians everywhere, but I do see that a lot, right? Like a lot of musicians are developers, for example, uh, or like people involved in marketing SEO. I think there's a tie into that for sure. And that ability to think creative, cr- creatively, but also mechanically or technically is a complete parallel in the music, right? I mean, when I play a scale, there's a technique behind that. I could play it fast. I could play it quiet. I could play it soft, but there's also like musicianship to that as well, Mm. right? Like I can play it with some, some form of being expressive or, um, you know, not playing it perfect is like a thing. So um, yeah, that like right brain, left brain, that whole thing is really important. That comes from music. Um, by the way, I did hear that the idea of right brain, left brain was debunked recently. Have you heard that too? I feel like so, all, almost all social science, I can just take with a grain of salt at this point. <laughs> Not, yeah. Nothing is replicating, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, but I, th- I still think there's still something. It's a good obviously. model. It's a good like framework to think about things, a mental model. Exactly. Yeah. As long as we know it's not literal at this point. Um, yeah. But uh, have you found the same too? Like it, could, you've got some instruments there and stuff, right? Has your um, experience with music impacted how you approach marketing and content? hundred percent. Yeah. I'm actually, so Pep is doing a conference next month. It's like the CXL 10 year. And he asked me to do a, a talk on like a, kind of a top 10 list of things I learned. And I was like, well, I have to do this in some sort of like creative way. I can't just do the top 10 things I learned about experimentation. So I'm actively putting together a list right now on the top 10 things that music taught me about growth. And there's oh, cool. several lessons. It's amazing. And the right brain, left brain thing, I think is the most pertinent and the most obvious that jumps out to me, um, mm-hmm. especially with certain instruments. It seems like um, there's a certain like with percussion, that's kind of my main background. Um, yep. I went to school for percussion initially. Um, it's mathematical. It's it's completely mathematical at a certain level. But then once you you um, you make that unconscious, once you once you make it intuitive, it's completely right brain. That it's completely just playful, right? Mm-hmm. But you're still doing mathematics in the background. And I think piano is, is also another instrument that is very, very explicitly mathematical and, and technical in many ways as yeah. you're learning the music theory, et cetera. But there's obviously a tonality, um, an emotional side as well. Um, so p- piano is your main instrument? That's right. Is yeah. that the one you started on? It is. Yeah. And they, they do. Now, this might be a myth at this point too, but when I used to teach piano, I always told people piano is the activity that you use the most parts of your brain simultaneously. That was really always what I had heard. I don't know if that still is true. It makes sense though. Right. But I've heard the same about rhythm. And actually I've also heard that um, uh, therapists uh, will give like mental health patients and stuff like that um, rhythm exercises because it improves mental health. Oh, interesting. Just like, having to coordinate, like do one thing with one hand and one thing with another hand is like really good for your emotions and your mental state, essentially. So this is a total tangent, but I find that like this world of, of everything digital all the time that we inhabit, it's like nice to just have something tactile. So like yeah. sometimes I get up midday and I just play a little riff on the guitar. Or I've actually got like a puzzle in front of me now. Like I'm doing puzzles now. I find that there's something therapeutic to just like stepping away from the screen for a little bit and like making your hands do something creative. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I keep a, I keep a little mini keyboard in my office and um, sometimes on breaks, I'll plug it in and work on a little bit of music, but also the tactile thing is important. I think, I think it's missed a lot in the day and age of working on the computers or being physical in any way whatsoever. I also keep a block down here by my foot so I can Mm. stretch my heel while I'm standing on phone calls um, I keep like one of those l- lacrosse balls and it's great for like massaging your foot or just even tossing it back and forth while you're talking. Um, I do think certain people are much more tactile and what do they call it? Kinesthetic, right? So you have like a kinesthetic learning style. I definitely fit into that, <laughs> that bucket in that category. It sounds like you might as well. So it is interesting, right? Because like we talk about it as a tangent, 
But what if you are somebody listening to this and you feel like you're not as productive or creative in marketing or SEO or whatever you're up to content? What if introducing something physical into your day-to-day work actually sparks that for you, right? So it's like this weird thing where, yeah, it's like a tangent topically speaking, but it actually could be helpful for people, you know, if they're feeling like uninspired or not able to tap into creativity or something. So I've been watching a, a masterclass. I love masterclass, by the way, mm-hmm. on um, S. Devlin. She She's like a visual a designer uh, of sorts, like she designs experiences so that she did like the weekend's halftime show. And I discovered her via this, this experience called super blue in Miami. Mm-hmm. And the first several lessons, she's like, all right, we're just going to, we're going to get physical here. Like uh, she traces over like some drawings without any rhyme or reason. Right. She's just like making the pen move in her hand. And she says, that's very important because yep. it does something to your brand. I can't remember what she says it does. But then she starts like chopping up paper and like actually doing like origami style um, to create these first drafts. And yeah. her whole thesis is that just getting getting your hands moving gets you out of your left brain, gets you a little bit more into like pattern connection, a little bit more into induction and um, kind of free flowing reasoning versus like mm-hmm. trying to fit anything into a narrow box that you've already got kind of in mind. Um, yeah. And I think that's clearly uh, applicable to to marketing and growth. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of things um, people in... SEO or marketing can learn from designers. Like designers even now will use post-it notes or um, Mm. index cards in certain design exercises or processes, right? To get it out there in something physical, um, which can also help your creative, you know, process as well. So yeah, I'm a huge believer in all that. Um, But uh, the, the music thing is interesting. Even you might agree with this too. Just listening to music mm-hmm. helps with um, my state, right? But also um, feeling more productive or energized working as well. Um, have you also heard the thing where productive people will listen to the same song on repeat over and over and over and over, over again? And before I had even heard that, that's something I always used to do, even back to being a little kid. Yeah, I've never heard of that, but I do that. I 100% do that. Or the same very small playlist. Like, so it'll be the same four or five songs on repeat, but I do find it creates some sort of a background noise or something in which I can like have the the um, tonality, like the emotional flavor that a music gives me that like little rush, but yep. it doesn't interject into the thought process. Like I, it's, it's kind of background noise still, you know? Yeah. I, th- I believe I had heard Tim Ferriss first talk about that too, by the way. Hmm. Um, no, no shocker there probably. Right. Um, but also uh, your um, pulse and other bodily rhythms will sync to the music that you listen to. Right. So I would imagine like if you have, if you're just listening to different song after different song, after different song, your body's not settling into mm, something. Switching up too right? often. Yeah. But it's like multitasking of sorts. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So when I listen to music, it's always generally within the same style. Right. So there's a sync there going, but also, yeah, the same song over and over will keep your just rhythm sort of, you know, consistent, which I would imagine would help it make, make it easier to work as well. So for sure. I want to, um, I think the, the lens of music is interesting because one thing I like to do, we'll talk tactics for sure, but is I like to understand how people think and like Mm -hmm. what, um, kind of operating models people are using. And I think a a life spent in music is clearly going to influence some of how you think about your work and how you approach problem solving with SEO. So with piano, um, my hypothesis is that you've probably done some composition. It sounds like the composition is one aspect that you really enjoy about music. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yep. So that's something that I have, uh, I guess, like in common as well is like with guitar, I've always enjoyed the songwriting process. Mm-hmm. Because I think, and I've, I love the performance stuff too. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you love that as, as much, but like it, for me, like that, I, I get a little kick out of that with like podcasting and, and conferences and, and any sort of like, um, you know, I'm on the spot right now. And like, we're basically going to, you know, put a product together live. So I yeah. love that aspect, but I've always loved the part about composition where there's some aspect of detail orientation. Every note matters, how you play every note matters. And this is alluding to what you said before, because I think it totally ties into SEO but you've got like the micro, the uh, detail oriented, but you have to fit that into the macro plan else. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's worthless. It's forest for the trees type thing. So have you made that connection consciously? It, it, it sounds like you think about your podcast in the same way too, because you've mentioned like all the details with regards to sound and like uh, th- almost journalistic, like how you, how you draw lessons out of different people. Yeah. So the holistic, like, you know, how the program feels, 
It yeah. sounds like you think in this way. I do. Yeah. I, so to get super specific with content for SEO. So one thing I work on a lot with clients is like blog posts, articles, basically content marketing for search. And um, I see it all the time in search where like, if we get too lost in the details in an article, it's going to flop. If I only focus on the big picture, we're going to miss a lot of the important details and it's going to flop, right? So when I'm doing content, like I help guide clients all the way through from just the overall structure. What are the H2s, right? What's the general flow to the very specific details of like, how does this sentence communicate to Google and users what we want it to, right? So like you can analyze a document, a paragraph, a sentence, and a word by all kinds of different attributes, you know, whether it's transactional in tone, is it a positive, neutral, or negative sentiment? Is it a noun, a verb, a whatever, adjective, right? Um, what's the possible topic that that, you know, piece of content aligns to? It's like all of it, right? And mm -hmm. so that's one thing I have to do with clients is help them understand and analyze and like work on content so it fits those buckets better. Right. So in other words, you don't want a um, blog post to have all kinds of transactional oriented content on it because a blog post is more informational in nature. It should be things about like, what is this thing? How do you use it? What are the benefits like the history or the facts or whatever? Contrary to that, I just tweeted earlier, we had an e-commerce category page and I removed like 1500 words of informational content from that page and it started ranking better. Right. So this is just the idea of like stepping back and looking at that page, looking at the big picture and going, OK, what's the general idea of this page? It's a, either an e-commerce page or it's a blog post or it's an article or whatever, making sure that's in alignment, but then making sure all the details are in alignment, too, and understanding how all of those things work together. It's very important. Um, I think a lot of SEOs get lost in one or the other. You know, some see the big picture well. Some see the details well and obsess over every little keyword or something, but it's really a matter of both. And I think you touched upon like uh, thought models as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer in let's get it good enough and ship it mm. and then iterate, right? So like, let's get something. So the big picture is like 85% there. All right. And not stress the last 15% yet. Let's get all the details 85% of the way there and then worry about all those details more so later on, right? So I'm also a big believer in like when I'm working this way and thinking big and small, I'm not thinking like we have to be perfect, like big and small. I'm thinking let's get us like most of the way there and then work and iterate after that, right? So it's very similar to like, you know, just ship it mentality type of thing. So that'd be another thought model that I tend to operate on with content a lot. Is that mental model, What what's the purpose of that model? Is it to get people out of their heads and just start shipping to combat perfectionism? Or is it with the idea that I, I guess there's going to be faster feedback loops once you get things out the door versus just like in the corner office or whatever? Yeah, a little bit. It's both. So mechanically in the SEO world, I always like to say doing content for SEO is like being a comedian. So mm -hmm. like a comedian works in the material in front of an audience mm -hmm. and then refines it with that actual feedback loop. Like a comedian literally can't work on the material without an audience, right? Mm -hmm. We as content publishers for SEO, we can do what we think is a really good blog post, hit publish, but we actually don't know if it's going to work or how well until we get that feedback loop from Google, right? The impressions, the clicks, the click-through rate from search console or ranking data or something like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the reason why I just ship it and then iterate later is because of that mechanics of SEO, right? So like, I always think that you talk about mental models as well. So like probably my biggest operating mental model is 80, model is 80, 20 principle. Um, that I also got from Tim Ferriss years ago. It has literally been, it's changed the entire way I approach everything, right? So we could talk 80, 20 as well, but just for anyone that needs to get caught up, it's not like a lot of people mistake what they think the 80-20 principle is. It's not the idea of going, we're going to spend 80% of time here and 20% on other things. It's the idea that the, the inputs are indirectly proportionable to the outputs, right? So 20% of your inputs are going to result in 80% of the results or output. And you can combine any two sets of data to get to that, right? So 
the first 80% of time that a client puts on a piece of, or the first 20% of time that a client puts into a piece of content is going to be 80% of their results, mm. right? So I'm not going to have them do that last, you know, 80% of the work or, you know, the numbers always play out a little bit differently, but I'm going to have them do as much as they need to, to get the initial results and then worry about the rest later, right? So that 80-20 is something I layer into like everything that I do. I'm curious. So the 80-20 is something I try to think about quite a bit as well, because I, I do, mm -hmm. I'm also a yes man and I find myself taking on more tasks than I should. So I found it really useful for myself as an elimination tool. When I start mm -hmm. to think about all the wasted activity, it's like, well, if I'm writing a blog post, this thing's going to I write these long form, pretty technical pieces for my site, my personal website. Yep. If I spend a lot more time thinking about every little stylistic change I could make and every little image I could add and like all the micro optimizations, well, I'm frankly never going to publish anything. So right. I spend the most of my time just writing and researching and actually getting the content and the substance out the door. So yep. do you have any, uh, what are the details that you think people should spend less time on? Because I'm on a, a hobby horse on people spend way too much time on editorial style guides and like passive versus active voice. And, and um, I, I just think most of most B2B blogs, like you're most people probably aren't going to those sites because of the style in which they're talking, which is always, by the way, it, it's always fun, informal, yet uh, professional. Like those are always the adjectives people use to describe them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have uh, items yeah. like that? You think people waste a lot of time on? I think of content more like um, carving marble. <laughs> So mm -hmm. um, I think of it more like there's not any one detail that I would leave out per se or like facet of the content, but getting it more to like just the general shape and then shipping it, if that makes sense. So mm. I guess what I'm trying to, it, it's, there's such an art form to this, right? It's really hard to give an answer because in the SEO world, I have some concrete things uh, like lines that I get to, and I know we're ready to ship. For example, I like to do a lot of topical analysis on content with a tool called Content Aced, which is kind of a newer tool, but it analyzes um, your content against a keyword and tells you topical gaps, essentially, mm. right? So if we run that through the tool and it gets a D, we're not done yet, right? It's just the tool is telling you we're not done. But if I run it and we're getting a B or an A, and I kind of look at it as a human, I'm like, yeah, I think we've got like... 80% of the topics we need to account for in this blog post, then we're done. Then I'm like, let's publish, see how it goes. So what I'm thinking about is it's going to be another five hours, hypothetically, for some content person to have to add in the last remaining 20% of topics. Mm. That five hours is not important enough to like spend the time now. What I'd rather do is publish in Google, see if it's good enough. Right. You and might rank number decide. one with a B plus right. and like, you might as well see that and move on to the next piece before marginally exactly. trying to increase the input and the outputs the same. That's right. So huh. you mentioned passive voice and stuff like that. I do have all my clients run content through Hemingway app. Mm, that's cool. But it's, it's not a black and white. Do we use it or not? When I, when we use it, I tell them, uh, try to get rid of all the very hard to read sentences, focus on that maybe trim down a little bit of the passive voice stuff or whatever, but like all I care about is the very hard to read sentences and then we're done. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of like, do we use it or not like black and white? It's like, let's just use it enough to like, just trim that the very hard to read stuff down a little bit and get it good enough. Right. Um, so it is a hard, I, the only way to answer that concretely is to break it down into the different aspects of content. I think, um, you know, another thing I'm really uh, adamant about with clients is the first sentence of a piece of content, mm. right? And so when we're doing that for SEO, let's say, um, you know, I have a client that sells precious metals. So let's say the post is the most valuable pennies, right? I always encourage the client to make the first sentence about that exact topic, because like that kind of anchors the topic for Google and for users, right? So mm -hmm. like a lot of clients will make the mistake of going like, why coin collecting is fun and you should do it and blah, blah, blah. Like or start with like a cute a story or something like that. Right. The common example of what you've seen probably is like all the recipe bloggers, right? That tell the, the full worst. story about their grandma. So um, 
that's a whole other topic. But um, so I'm 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 very very adamant about having a really good first sentence. So I'll I'll make that sentence like I, I want that to be perfect. But I'm not going to make every sentence be perfect in the entire piece of content. Mm-hmm, right? right. Let's really nail the sentences that matter. Right. So like first sentence, maybe the one thing I'm very adamant about is the structure of um, what is and definition sentences. So those I'm going to be very, very particular about, right? Because those so, might pick up some keyword snippets or something like that. Exactly. Right. But a lot of the other sentences, I'm not going to be as particular. So, you know, that's where it's like the best way to answer, like, where do I stop and then ship something is always to look at like a specific piece of content. Mm-hmm. Right. And like, cause we can really see and get a sense for it. It does, it does depend upon a lot upon the topic and the content type and all that kind of thing. So. Yeah. I wonder what, what are some of the other dimensions that you look at when grading a piece of content and how to mm-hmm. pass that 80% bar? Cause it sounds like there's the keyword, I guess, topic relevance and topic gaps, and then there's readability and the actual editorial style and language that people are using and then anchoring with the first sentence and possibly, you know, context, Con- setting context and basically like uh, attention grabbing. Are there mm-hmm. other things that you look for when you're analyzing a piece of content for pass fail? Yeah. So the, the degree of transactional to informational language, right? So in Google, there's this entire concept of like informational to mid funnel to transactional oriented pages, content, keywords, etc. Everything on a piece of content should, should have the right percentage, I think, of that degree of transactional to informational content. And it's entirely dictated by the keyword. And which is funny because like some keywords actually, you'd think they'd be informational just by the keyword alone, but then you search in Google and Google's ranking like product pages or like pages like, um, like uh, the, the, the best of lists, like Like wired listicles. Yeah. Affiliate listicles. Mm -hmm. So I always look at though, are we hitting the right mark for that degree of transactional, the informational content? And literally like my, what I usually do is just estimate the percentage of transactional, the informational of what I'm seeing in Google. And then I just want my client's website to, to mirror that same percentage. Right. So if I'm seeing product widgets and category pages and, ads and like if like 80 percent of google's search result page for a given keyword is transactional i want my client's piece of content to be 80 percent transactional so product widgets for sale language buy language um product benefits like all that kind of stuff so that's another really really important thing that i think a lot of people miss you know are there tools that can help us with this now or is it still basically qualitative like you take a look at the keyword the serp page and then you gauge like qualitatively how you're matching up to that with the piece of content or can can ahrefs or something do this yet i don't know if a tool does the transactional the informational thing i've wanted to mention that to the developer of the tool called content aced that i mentioned Mm -hmm. Uh, because i think if any tool could do that they could probably build that in i don't know if a tool that does that element of content analysis though i think there should be one that's so. what I was thinking is like, it sounds like content ace is, is similar to phrase.ai mm-hmm. and uh, clear scope and, and all that stuff. I think one of those tools, if they were, if somebody was to do it, it would probably be one of them because they've already got the machine learning. They've already got like the, the SERP scrapers and everything. This, this is, by the way, it, this was a dream of mine at HubSpot because mm-hmm. I started building tools to uh, scrape the SERPs and basically... We have the whole surround sound strategy, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. We, I'm not, no. Yeah, instead of trying to rank like a single HubSpot, you know, like rank for everything already. So instead of just trying to rank our single page, like uh, whether it's product page or a blog post, let's say for best live chat software, mm-hmm. like, well, people are probably comparison shopping at this stage. So it's kind of like going to a cocktail party and asking, you know, what books have you been reading recently? And if you hear one book mentioned once, it's like, well, maybe I'll yeah. check that out. But if everybody in the group says the same book, well, you're probably going to buy that thing. Mm -hmm. So our our goal was to basically monopolize the search results pages and for best live chat software be included on every list, hopefully at position one. And there was no tool that really showed us that. So I built a a thing that would, you know, look for HubSpot within like an Ahrefs link uh, on Mm -hmm. the page. Um, I never got the intent stage, but I was like, if I could map out the intent of each keyword, Mm -hmm. that would be so cool. But it's it's a very complex problem, I think. It is. Yeah. Um, that sounds like a really cool tool though. 
Somebody should do that. Somebody listening should just build all these tools. I know. Um, if it wasn't built under HubSpot's IP, then I, I would probably do it. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other elements or ways that I kind of analyze. I mean, so one thing is just the every time I give a topic to a client, I label it by content type. And I don't think that means what a lot of other people think it means, right? So for every blog post, I have certain categories of content. One might be what I call an information list. So that could be benefits of marketing or marketing strategies or types of marketing. Anytime you have that plural noun in the search phrase, that it's telling you the user wants a list of these things. Mm -hmm. right? That's what I call an information list. And that's my most go-to content type. Because it's just a, it's what we call a listicle, right? But like, I don't like to call it that because that sounds low quality. It's got a bad but, connotation. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It has a kind of negative Buzz thing. But if done, yeah. If done really well, they come out. I mean, when you look at most content in Google, it's all list format stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I always label, you know, you have versus content, right? Like marketing versus advertising. That, so the reason I label the content type is because that's, my first step at getting the client towards having the right structure of on the page, right? So if it was marketing strategies and they did the complete guide to marketing, that's a mismatch in content type. Mm -hmm. The user doesn't want a guide to marketing. They want just a straightforward list of strategies. You know, conversely, if it's like um, literally a search for guide to marketing, we don't just want to give a list of strategies. We, we want to actually make a guide. So getting that right content getting the right content formats important, but like, this is where it's weird with SEO is because like, I can give you a keyword and without Googling it, we can think it's one content type, but then we Google it. And then we see Google has actually figured out a different content type, right? So there, that's why manual SERP analysis is like the best way to go. That's my uh, big pet peeve uh, is like, we, the hardest thing for our content agency in many ways has been fighting uphill against like the bad reputation that other firms have, have given content agencies because right. oftentimes what happens is they do a strategy audit and content roadmap. And it's literally just a list of keywords like that with no real insights as to like how to structure that piece of content. You get a keyword mm -hmm. content marketing. Well, what does that mean? Is it the ultimate guide to content marketing? Is it what is content marketing? Is it 10 content marketing tips? You know, like, is it content marketing software? It could be so many different things, but without that context, it's like you kind of left wondering and guessing and possibly spending a lot of time and money creating content that doesn't map to the intent that the user was expecting. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, um, with the Precious Metals client, a uh, while back, I presented to them the idea of doing buyer's guides, right? So like the buyer's guide to silver or like stuff like that. And at the time, I thought that having this sort of mid-funnel, literally buyer's guide content was just going to make their e-commerce category pages rank better. Because this is, again, another thing of example of the micro to macro Mm -hmm. Not only do we need to be uh, in inclusive of transactional to informational content per page, but the entire site as well. Right, so right. think about an e-commerce site, the e-commerce sites that don't work as well are the ones that have all these top of funnel blog posts, and then they have categories and products, but no mid-funnel mm -hmm. content. So the e-commerce website, when you think of REI, like REI has done an amazing job with like buyer's guides and mid-funnel content. Um, that's a, like always my prime go-to example, but any e-commerce site that's missing that mid funnel of content, they're not going to rank as well for the top of funnel or the mid funnel because they're missing an entire chunk of the user journey, right? Like Google wants to rank a site that satisfies the entire user journey, like when that makes sense. So what I thought was going to happen, we'd create these buyer guides and they'd help the e-commerce pages rank better. What actually happened is the buyer's guides often outrank and drive more traffic to the bottom funnel buy keywords. Mm -hmm. So if you Google like buy silver or buy gold or whatever, like all their buyer's guides rank for this stuff. So it's a little bit of the opposite of what we're talking about where matching the keyword to the content type and the intent and the manual SERP analysis. And you're talking about that being a pain point, right? With clients and stuff. Uh, that's why it's so weird because we didn't, Unless we had created those buyer's guides, we never would have known that it would have worked that way. Um, there's a great concept of intent gaps, hmm. right? I think somebody wrote a post a little while ago and they called it like intent gaps. Um, and another example is 
<laughs> in the precious metal metals world, people think you can buy gold and silver at spot price, which is basically like the lowest possible value for gold and silver, but you can't actually do that. But people go to Google and they go, they search buy silver at spot price, which you can't do. So I had my client create a piece of content called why you can't buy silver at spot price. Huh. And they completely destroy it with that piece of content, right? Like they rank well, they get traffic, they even get conversions from that because it creates trust. But the point there is like, who would ever thought a piece of content saying why you can't do this thing that you just Googled is actually going to outperform everything else, right? But it's this weird intent gap. So it's just very fascinating how you can't always rank with a literal search might make you think you can rank. So I like the idea of an intent gap and the way you described it, it's like, I guess it kind of maps to the idea of like a pillar and cluster model of sorts. Although I don't think that model ever explicitly spoke about filling in each intent type. And then Mm -hmm. it also horizontally maps out to maybe like a customer journey map of sorts where you Mm -hmm. do explicitly try to do the awareness, the consideration and the decision stage. And you sort of combine the two, like you've got a pillar, whatever head keyword of like live chat software. And then within that, you've got six, seven, eight, nine different intent types that you've got to fill and mm-hmm. like through writing all of that stuff, you, sh- you maybe internal link and show Google that you've got some topical authority there as well. Um, and sometimes there's some unpredicted successes within that as well, where you're like, holy yep. shit, this ranks for a high intent keyword. This is cool. So, I know you're, are you currently at HubSpot too, by the way? I apologize. Nope. Even no. Okay. So you're a former HubSpot, but you were at HubSpot. Yeah. So <clears> feel free to, yeah. One one thing I <laughs> I always talk down on all the time is um, topic clusters. Right. And uh, so in, in my entire career of doing SEO, I have never once created a pillar page or what I, the traditional idea of a pillar page, maybe I've done it by accident, but never think of it that way. And I adamantly don't create topic clusters, right? Cause like, I just, I always say it's a hammer looking for a nail, right? You've got this one. Okay. So you're hundred percent, even though you've been at HubSpot, it's just this one type of site architecture or page architecture, but it like doesn't work in most situations. It or it, like it could get you a decent like decent amount of the way there, but it's sort of like the like one size fits all plan if you can't or don't want to come up with a more custom strategy or plan, right? Right. So I always say like let the keywords dictate your structure, right? So like whenever I'm helping clients build out content or like stuff like that, it's like, let's let the the keyword landscape dictate what that structure should be. Like just good information architect. It's like, I feel like another mental model would be, let's let the information architecture reveal itself. Mm. Like let's not try to force it into, like, I feel like a lot of times when I'm doing SEO and keyword research, I'll often say like, my job is not to be creative. My job is to uncover like just the natural existence of keywords and searches that are out there and find that sort of natural synergy that they should sort of fit into, right? Not force it into this like pre-built idea of topic clusters or pillar page or something like that. So that's, that's another big way that I think very differently from many, many people doing SEO out there, right? Um, but it works. I mean, you know, I always like to like if if it didn't get results, then I would go to pillar pages and try that, right? But <laughs> absolutely, I, the the hammer looking for a nail is exactly how I see that one. And in fact, like I've got a rant about many frameworks or the idea of frameworks because I think individually, um, if you just look at one, they often cause more harm than good. Because what you do is basically exactly what you said, hammer looking for a nail. And I frankly find a lot of people misunderstand them. So the pillar and cluster model is misunderstood more often than it is understood. Right. People come to us and they always want this model applied, but they don't really know what that means. They want like some pillar page that's built for some reason on a different URL structure, like a landing page versus or a website page versus a blog post. I, I don't know why that was the model, yeah. um, but nobody really understands what it means. I mean, the idea of internal linking topical authority totally mm-hmm. valid. But then this explicit, very concrete way to do it doesn't really make sense. Right. But it's like, I look at the frameworks as kind of tools in the toolkit. So mm-hmm. you can you can plug and play like in different situations. You're like, all right, 
pillar and cluster works here. All right, yep. this model looks works here better. But when you when you try to apply it in all situations, I think you run into trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like so if, if I'm going to go down the the rabbit hole of like things I adamantly don't do in the SEO world, pillar pages mm-hmm. is one, but the other one is the whole concept of eat from mm-hmm. Google expertise, authority, trust. You and know. this is more like for health and like various specialist sites mainly, or yeah, this is, and this is where all the myths come from. So mm-hmm. sort of, so like just for quick background for anybody, um, the concept of eat expertise, authority, trust originally came from Google's quality raters guidelines. What are the quality raters guidelines? They are Google's document that just trains their quality raters that rate websites and Google results, right? You can think of it like Google has said, it's like people doing taste testing at a restaurant, right? Like they're not going to impact the recipe. They're just telling you how good the food came out essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's doing QA on Google and their results. So the quality raters guidelines never had anything to do with the algorithm, but it had to do with what the algorithm should produce as a result. So like if the algorithm's working, you're going to get a page that a user thinks is written by an expert or they think is authoritative or they think has some level of trust to it. But those are so nebulous, like they're nebulous. Like what does that mean? Trust, right? Like how is that factored into an algorithm? I mean, we know in some part it has to do with maybe backlinks and stuff like that, but this is where SEOs I think took the concept of eat way too far and I think it's a little bit more like icing on the cake rather than getting at the core of how you should optimize content, right? So I think the fundamental of optimizing content is literally just the words on the page. And it's everything I talked about earlier. Like I can throw a thousand words into some tool and it will analyze it for you, right? And like, if you look at Google's natural language API, if you go to their website, they have a free tester where you can like test the natural language API, you can throw content in there and it tells you very specifically what categories they think it belongs to, what sentiment every sentence is, um, what entities appear in that content. And um, it analyzes every single word and punctuation, et cetera, of your sentence structure. And that's just what the free tool is doing. Right? So imagine what Google's algorithm is actually doing, right? So. And so you said like eat is like the medical thing or whatever, like that's yeah, I was thinking of it. It's just like, Oh, doctor, something reviewed by doctor, something that's, that's yeah. what I picture. So think about this. Um, anything that can be gamed easily is not a part of the algorithm, right? Mm-hmm. I could put any doctor's name on any website I want to. doesn't mean it was written by that doctor. Right. So that's where it's tricky. And like, I've, even tried to do some due diligence a couple months ago and researched, well, what are the current SEOs saying is eat? Like, what do you do to to a page to make it more eat optimized or whatever? There's not a lot there, right? It's like maybe some things that happen to help with the algorithm directly or make the content better in some way. But I just find there's a lack of it being concrete. I'd much rather look at a piece of content and say, I can definitively say, how transactional this language is. That's like definitive. When you think about that, that's the type of thing Google's algorithm should be able to detect. So anyways, I, you know, I say a lot on Twitter, like I've spent no more than half a second ever thinking about eat when it comes to my client's content and SEO and optimization. I, so I think Google has learned to analyze text and content so well that they understand when it was written by an expert Mm -hmm. and it's very field and topic specific. They know what an expert piece of medical content is versus an expert piece of, um, you know, marketing content, right? Like it's pattern recognition. It's looking for what types of sentence structure and words and like sentiment and all that kind of thing. So that's where I think the whole concept of eat is like not super helpful. (laughs) Like if you want to directly work on your optimization, I think you could accidentally use it and optimize for some things, but it's not, it's not the direct path towards results. So, so how there's, there's a lot of these algorithm updates. There's a lot of news and trends and frameworks that come out. 
The question I have at a high level is how much of this is signal and how much of it is noise? How much has SEO actually changed in recent years? <laughs> because I always think that it's probably simpler than we make it out to be. And then there's some stuff on the margins that you can po- possibly micro optimize. Like if yeah. you have intent match, amazing content, quality links, and an actual website experience that can flow into you know some sort of business worthy conversion. Yep. And that feels like the 80%, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of it's noise. Um, I think there's a few small things that are signal. Um, the constant SERP changes. So like the elements Google's bringing in and out of search result pages, just keeping an eye on that's important, right? That can inf- affect click throughs. But I think the biggest thing that's- that, in- the, Sorry to interrupt. That's more, you're speaking more about like Google adding their own things and not necessarily like changing the order of, of ex- external sites and rankings, like more yeah. so like snippets and like calculators and like stuff that they have native on, on the SERP. That's right. Like people also ask mm-hmm. um, knowledge panels. Um, one thing we can get into is what I've been calling Google's algorithmically generated microsites. I want to get into that in a minute. But the biggest moving target as far as what quote unquote changes in SEO is just how Google is always changing how they interpret the intent of search queries, Mm. right? So what I'm not following as changes a whole lot is like, oh, did they tweak this ranking factor or that ranking factor? I mean, there might be a little bit of that. There might be a little bit of like, so for example, core web vitals and the page experience thing, like that's something on the peripheral to know about, but the core the 80% of optimizing SEO is like understanding the intent of the search query and creating content that, that matches that or the core fundamentals of like really good tech SEO, right? Like crawling site architecture, page speed, like most of that stuff hasn't changed either. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a lot of it's noise. Like a lot, I do appreciate a lot of the work that a lot of the current SEOs do to analyze algorithm updates. But at the end of the day, it's like, it doesn't really ever change any of my action items ever that I have a client. It's like, what do you, what do you do about it? You know? Yeah. It's like, I, you know, I think one of the last examples of an algo update was the CXL one that I mentioned, which Mm. I determined that people were being distracted from the main content because of the, the pictures of people on the sidebar. You know, that was called a phantom update, right? That was one of the last updates I can remember where like, it was analyzed. We isolated this like distinct algorithm change and ranking factor that was actionable that we could we could put into practice to improve websites, right? Like most of the what they call the core updates now are, in my opinion, they're updates of how Google understands search intent mm-hmm. or different query spaces and page types and stuff like that. So that's where they're moving, right? And there are some other, like I said, peripheral updates like. I think I'm still very interested in like image search and image optimization. And Google announced something recently at one of their conferences. This is how little I pay attention. Like most SEOs obsess over every word that comes out of a Google Google conference. I just like follow a few tweets. But the takeaway was like how important image search is coming. I believe they're using image recognition to understand what an image is. And then that's playing a role in search results or something like that. Um, so yeah, but a lot of it's noise. A lot of it is noise. But the thing I wanted to mention was this idea of what I've been calling uh, algorithmically generated microsite. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is something I'm, uh, it's a term that I'm using and I'm trying to use it a lot because I think it's where it's a possibility of where Google's going. And I think they're doing it right in front of everybody's eyes and no one's noticing. All right. So if we step back, we think about what is Google supposed to be? They're a search engine, right? Like think of a classic search engine. You Google a keyword, 10 blue links, right? Obviously, we know over the years, Google has added SERP features like knowledge panels and snippets. And people also ask questions and ads and all this other you know, maps and search results. But more or less, it's still been like a one-for-one like search and then a list of results. They're just displayed in different ways. Now, if, and I tweeted the other day, there's searches where this is happening. And I think it started beginning with COVID searches a little bit. If you search Tom Hanks, this is what I tweeted the other day. Uh, Google's been starting to do this on a lot of types of searches. I get a search result of results for Tom Hanks, right? I get IMDb, I get Wikipedia, I get news results, videos. 
But at the top, there's a menu that says overview, movies, news, TV shows, awards, videos, right across the top. Like, this is a microsite disguised as a search engine. And the sort of, I don't even know if I want to call it an issue, right? Like, there's all kinds of issues with Google about them scraping content or like trying to monetize in aggressive ways or whatever. But we're not looking at a single search result page anymore. We're looking at a web page where Google has now added a menu which nudges people into then clicking the other items in this menu. Now, when I click movies, that results in the search query changing and the keyword query changing to Tom Hanks movies, right? And then I click news and it's the same thing. It's Tom Hanks and now I see news results, Tom Hanks TV show. So this is a, it's like a multi-page result where I Google Tom Hanks, but then I get the set of pages that Google is dictating or like strongly nudging us towards searching as a user. Mm -hmm. And I find that, I mean, if it's problematic, that's a side, but I find that very interesting because it's just the idea of like Google creating essentially a microsite mm -hmm. and what I call an algorithmically generated microsite, right? Where they're using their algorithm to come up with these menu items and what the result should be on the pages. Um, another way that I, years ago, I tweeted about this, like sometimes um, if you uh, Google something like grip strength, and this is the example I shared like three years ago, in the knowledge panel on the right, you'd see like benefits, how to improve, like whatever, and they'd be all drop downs. And you open all each one of those up. And by the time you open up all those things, it looks like you have a web page right there. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's a search result, but you open all the knowledge panels and all the people also ask questions and everything. All of a sudden, it looks like you have a piece of content that's just piecemealed together by all the results Google is pulling together on that page. And so is that a search engine at that point or is it now a piece of content, right? And so it's this weird, funny line where like, again, I've, I feel like Google's turning into content, like in front of our eyes and we're not realizing it, right? And this is bad for SEOs and content marketers because you're not going to get the click through to your site. You're not going to be able to capture the information. You're not going to be able to convert because it's living natively on, on a Google search results page. Yeah, it's really tricky, right? Because the metric that tells us how bad that is would be, what's that differential between how many people would have clicked but didn't click in version A of Google and version B of Google, right? Mm -hmm. But like, how do we really know that at this point? Because Google's so far along... It's not like we can ever go back to a day when I can compare a result for Tom Hanks to 10 blue links, right? If, it, if Google was a traditional, like classic search engine, I mean, the click-throughs would be huge on that, right? Because you'd have to click on a result to get the information you want. But we don't have that version of a search engine anymore. I mean, even Bing copies everything Google does, literally, right? So yeah, it's a tough one because Google's slowly and slowly been pulling more information into the SERP that like, who knows what the actual click-through rate would be of just a pure search at this point, right? Do you think it diminishes the importance or I don't know how to say this, but like from a reader's perspective, if it's all in the Google SERP, I can't really weigh the accountability and trust I have for a brand as much. So like on the reader side, I feel like it's a little bit more difficult to like parse that information. You, you kind of have to just trust it at face value because it's on Google's page. Right. And then on the flip side, it's like the brand doesn't get as much value because you, you can't really like display your design, um, you know, the, the emotional resonance you want to have. So it kind of reduces the power of the brand on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I'm getting IMDb's content right here in Google, I'm not getting any of the impact I would get from that same content in IMDb's website, which I think is your point. Um yeah. And let's say you don't trust IMDb for some reason as, as a, a viewer and you actually right. wanted information from Rotten Tomatoes or something. Yeah. Well, the information on Google's page is from IMDb. So, and it, I think it becomes a little harder to parse out like where the source is from in the first place. That's right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the example I tweeted was, um, and I think they may have, they, yeah, Tom Hanks Awards. So I'm seeing it right now. I think this might be a little bit of a test, but if I Google Tom Hanks Awards, 
I'm literally seeing above the fold or like, um, how should I say Google is displaying, I don't know if it's like 30, 40 awards right in the search result page, um, with no attribution. I don't know where this content's coming from. Right. And so you talked about like, do I trust an IMDB or not, even if it's in Google? Well, now this is Google. Like, I think this is Google's content, which is a list of all the Tom Hanks awards. You know, I don't know it, why it's not attributed or where it's coming from, but I guess me as a user, I have a problem trusting that because there's no attribution at all. Mm -hmm. And I just have to assume it's coming from Google or something or like maybe an official source. But even if so, it'd be good if there was some sort of attribution there. Um, so yeah, I mean, you bring up a really interesting point, like, you know, the trust that we have in content, like, well, that erode as well. Um, yeah, it's just, it's pretty wild because like Google has such control over the information that we see. And I feel like this algorithmically generated microsite is like giving even more trust into the hands of Google because now it's like they're creating a whole website experience. Right. It's not like it's not like me as a user, I need to think for myself and go, oh, what's the next thing I want to search about Tom Hanks? Like Google's giving that to us with literally a menu. And like we know they're treating it like a piece of content, because if you click the three little dots, you can share this page, like as if it's just a web page, which to me is like another just signal that they're thinking of this as like a little piece of content. So mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I found fascinating is that SEOs tend to have this, um, uh, I don't know, double-edged sword relationship with Google where it's like, we've clearly built businesses from it, um, helped generate a lot of value for clients. But then because you see all of these cutting edge trends, there's mm -hmm. always this slight grain of antagonism towards Google yeah. uh, because you, you sort of see the things that aren't being reported and like the mainstream, um, you know, doesn't really see, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a question. I just find it interesting because we're, we, I guess we're on the front line. So you see stuff like this and you're like, eh, is this a good thing? Is I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it is a very interesting observation. And, you know, I don't know if I have necessarily an answer to that either, but just to, just to echo that. Yeah. I mean, we are on the front lines. We are seeing it. Um, I know that even some F SEOs have been called to uh, maybe not testify, but provide information for some of the, um, you know, the more legal things that Google has gotten themselves into over the years too. So, but I think bringing it back to the SEO practitioner, like at a practical level, we can't change any, anything here, right? So to me, what drives the ship and the strategy and like results, it all comes back to going to search console. If I'm trying to rank for Tom Hanks, I just look at how many impressions it got, where it showed up and click through rate, right? And just have to understand in some spaces, you know, your highest click-through rate, even at a number one ranking might be 10%, not the classic 30%. So I think there's not a lot we can do about it. So, you know, and I think too, part, you know, part of your point perhaps is that like SEO is not going anywhere, right? Like even though Google's taking away more clicks, I think more people are searching Google than ever before as well. So like, just if you think about how many total searches are there in a day, like it's billions probably, right? So I think the world's adding more searches than Google is taking away clicks. I, that's my hunch. So, because uh, despite all this, and I work with some entertainment websites and stuff like that, I haven't seen a whole lot of erosion of traffic, even though Google's been introducing these features. So. And that ties into like maybe one of the last biggest points for anybody out there is building your brand, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one classic example is how like the amount of searches for Airbnb dwarfs the amount of searches for bed and breakfast. <laughs> it's like, I, I can Google it right now and look, but that'd be like a big takeaway. Like Google knows if somebody's looking for your brand or a branded term, that's where they're not going to show these search features, right? Right. They want to get 24.9 million searches a month for Airbnb, right? So, so brand continues to be a strong yeah. moat in this yeah. environment, maybe even more so. And in fact, I believe brand search volume is a ranking factor, mm -hmm. right? So Google has said time and time again, they want signals that aren't noisy and that they can uh, use to determine people want your website, right? And that's a, a hard to fake signal. Yeah. I mean, unless you try to hire a bunch of people to like 
search your brand name over and over again. But if they're so think about this, Google can more easily detect weird search behavior and patterns and click patterns probably more easily than like weird link networks in some right. ways, right? Because the link networks aren't on Google. Like if I'm on Google, Google has every little detail of user metric about what was searched, where it was searched from that Google account. If you're logged in, logged out, search history, click history. If you click on something, how long you dwell before you come back to Google, right? Like it is a completely clean signal for Google to know like how many people Google this brand and what did they do after that? So that's where I think brand is not only important to work against these SERP features, but also to, as a way to like build your traffic moat, you know, and keep organic traffic coming in. Uh, and we all know brand searches convert the highest, right? Out of any mm -hmm. type of search. So it's always a good motivator as well. Right. Growing a brand in your actual business seems like the most hard, the hardest thing to do, but also clearly the best thing to do in many ways. Do Absolutely. you um, do you think it's important to pull uh, pull back the curtain? Uh, not not necessarily like whistleblowing, like oh, this is unethical stuff. But mm -hmm. um, there's like the trends that Google uh, is is appearing to sh uh, surface. There's you, you mentioned link networks. You wrote a, a blog post a couple of years ago that I read uh, called um, "Why I Will Not Share" um, or "Why I Will Not Ask You to Share My Content." Yeah. <laughs> and you alluded, you alluded to the fact that there's basically upvote rings and sharing rings um, on Slack groups and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think most people know about this stuff, uh, especially people who don't work in digital marketing. But yeah. I would say I would wager that the ba vast majority of people in digital marketing actually don't know about this stuff. It's it's really like kind of a select group sometimes. Yep. Do you think there's some responsibility to um, you know show people what's how the sausage is made, so to speak? Um, maybe. I mean. Uh, for the, for the share networks, like, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say, I would definitely talk about that stuff and share that stuff at, at, at a certain point for, for me personally, like in my SEO career, um, it just, a you know, the, what happens when you get so busy with client work, like I don't focus on any of that other stuff, right? Like I haven't written a blog post for four years, probably. Um, if I was more in a position where I was like maybe running it. SEO software company or like, you know, Rand back in the day would always like quote unquote whistleblow stuff or whatever. Like if I was in more a position where that was in alignment with like my day-to-day -day work and supporting a company I was doing and like, I would absolutely do that. Right. It just doesn't fit into my day-to-day -day sort of like work at this point. But I think for people listening out there, yeah, I mean, these things are out there. If it is something you're more involved with, like if it's important to you, I think you should talk about it. Um, I think part of the point of that medium article too, is like, I don't want a noisy signal, mm -hmm. right? Like we talked about signal versus noise. When I create a piece of content or my clients do, I want to know if it actually worked like organically. I don't want to know if maybe it worked or was it that like link network? <laughs> or was it that the fact we asked a bunch of influencers to share it and like a few of them did, you know, just for whatever, right? Like, and that was my thing at the time was like, when I wrote, when I would write blog posts in the SEO industry, well, let me, let me say the opposite. People would reach out to me and they still do sometimes asking if I can share their content. Like mm. on Twitter. Oh yeah, I get those. Like yep. And a lot of times that blog post came from the fact that I would, I would always say no. <laughs> like some people got mad at me. Right. But it's like a lot of these people, I don't know who they are. Right. Or even if I do, like I'm the type of person where I want to read that blog post, you know, right. I want to spend a half an hour in it and like actually vouch for it. And that's hard to do if I don't know that person or their reputation or don't have the time to like read the article. So it would happen to me a lot where people would be like, Hey, can you share this thing? And I would not want to do it. Cause I only want to share stuff I believe in and actually know about, but on the flip side, and for anybody listening, like think about, you can't learn from that, right? Like, how do you know if your content's working? If you're just ask, asking people to share it and they're doing it because they're your buddy or something, right? Like I want the long-term satisfaction, but also just knowledge that what I'm doing is working and connecting with people. And so if it does, they'll share it on their own, right? Like I don't, I don't want the noise of people sharing stuff because they were asked. That's my own personal soapbox about the issue though. Uh, I actually, I think I totally agree with that. Yeah, that's I, I've never heard that opinion uh, espoused. 
mm -hmm. thing that I, I want to ask you is like, there's this common trope, um, which I actually disagree with that you should spend 80% of your time promoting content and 20% creating it. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Um, and how do you think about content promotion? Um, yeah. I mean, and it's, I always say this too, is like these high level concepts, like, of course, everyone has different opinions because we're not talking about a specific situation or mm -hmm. even type of business, right? It's like, I often say a lot in SEO, like a, a lot of debates in SEO go like this, like we'll be talking about um, soccer, but we say you need to know how to swing a bat really well, right? It's like, yeah, it's sports, but it's like SEO is sports, but we can't talk about SEO as if all sports are all the same thing, mm -hmm. right? It's so like when I see debates about SEO, like people are arguing and then I'm thinking like, well, if we're applying this to like an e-commerce site, yeah, that's true. But if we're applying what they're arguing about to like SaaS, it's not true at all, right? So like we needed to specify, I think it's always good to add an adjective like e-commerce SEO or local SEO or content SEO. So we're always going to debate. Um, and sorry, what was your question? Just like- How do you there, approach content promotion if, content if you're promotion. not going to ask people to share it? Like, what do you, how do you think about content promotion? So content promotion, again, depends a little on the situation, but in my day-to-day -day with clients, we don't think about content promotion at all for the most part, right? Like my job as an SEO practitioner, like my philosophy is to, you know, as they say, build really good content, let it get crawled, indexed, found on Google. People will link to that content on their own. So I'm a big fan of passive link acquisition, hmm. not this sort of like outreach or like whatever. Um, and the site authority will build on its own. People will share the site. Like if a company is doing real stuff, they're going to be doing hopefully PR, marketing, advertising that should promote them anyways, right? And like sometimes what I'll often try to do is help them layer best practices of SEO into what they're already doing. But for content specifically, once in a while, I might like nudge clients to share things on a channel that's important for them, like LinkedIn or Pinterest or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't, for me personally, I don't really ever go down the path of like large outreach campaigns or whatever, like I'm a big fan of paid promotion on mm -hmm. content in social, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, even Quora, stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that, right? Like, but that's just my personal approach to it. Like I have nothing against outreach per se or other forms of content promotion. Let's put it this way too. I mean, like all the clients I've worked with that have had success, we've reached that success without content promotion specifically so gotcha do you ever plan content specifically f like as as link bait content i guess if there's no better word for it like i know there's posts like marketing statistics or things like that like if you rank it it's probably going to get a bunch of links do you, do you ever yeah. like slot something into the plan based on that yeah. or is yeah we'll look at what i call intent to link search queries right so mm -hmm. like statistics mm -hmm. is a big one definitions stuff like that um, we'll definitely work those in. They don't always work all the time, but, uh, when they work sometimes, then, you know, we do 10 pieces of content like that. If five work great. So I do work that in, but again, that's more like good topic ideation, knowing what should happen as a result of that content. There's no like specific promotion activity that goes into that other than let's create a page that we know looks informational, that people are comfortable sharing and linking to. And then let Google and the users kind of do their job after that. So, um, um, can I ask you one question real quick? Yeah. What's your favorite, um, underrated music artist? My favorite underrated music artist. Oh boy. Um, so yeah, I won't pause on SEO questions, but have I thought about that question lately? Um, let me give one just classic go-to answer. Well, I'm thinking of maybe something newer. So I'm a pianist. Um, always been a fan of Keith Jarrett, right? Mm. Uh, Keith Jarrett is one of the best pianists of all time, in my opinion. He's very well known for, we talked about improv and stuff like that. He does entire solo piano concerts that are fully improvised, the entire thing, beginning to end. He's done dozens or hundreds of these. It's all on Spotify now. Like he wasn't on Spotify for a while, which used to drive me crazy. But I think like two years ago, they finally released his entire collection. Um, I think he's a remarkable, just 
um, creative person and also pianist specifically, but um, there's really nobody ever that's been like him before or since um, that, that approaches music and performance in quite the way that he does. Um, everything from how he plays to when, if you see a video of him playing, he stands, he sings, he moves around. He's like super animated, like a lot, he gets a lot of criticism for it and it turns a lot of people off. Right. But I think it's one thing that makes him very unique. So I think he's in his seventies now, but he's very worth checking out for anybody that wants to get out of, you know, just the typical modern loopholes that you'll get into. But uh, as far as other lesser known people that people should know, it's something I'd probably want to go through like a playlist and like look for. So I'm going to. No worries. You, you could send me something after this and I can add it to the blog post that we yeah, do. On actually, this. I'll, I'll mention somebody because he okay, always cool. likes when I mention him. So there's a producer. His, his producer name is Drew's That Dude. <laughs> and uh, he actually has produced hip hop for a lot of well-known people throughout the years. Like I believe like T-Pain and stuff like that. So if you listen to that kind of stuff, you'll hear some of his production, but he does a lot of his own instrumental productions now. And he's a creative genius in my opinion. Like he um, produces music that's very visual. Like there's just sounds everywhere and like many different instruments and layers. And like, you definitely feel like you're being sort of taken somewhere when you listen to his music. Um, and he's on Spotify and all the places now as well. So if you like instrumental hip hop, R and B with a slight electronic sort of visual slant to it, I think you'd, like to check out his stuff too. And he's, he's like very, very successful, but he's just not like a name that a lot of people know. So I love that. Well, that was a, obviously a purely selfish question because I'm looking for music recommendations. Yep. So I'll transition <laughs> to a purely altruistic finale. Yep. Where can people find you online? Um, so uh, Twitter's the best D A D A N underscore S H U R E on Twitter. Um, my podcast is experts in the wire. It's in all the places. Uh, LinkedIn's a decent spot to find me. Um, and you can find my music. I go by the name beat sculptor right now for music production. Um, that's cause my dad was a professional sculptor. So I kind of like a little tribute to him, but, um, I share my music a lot on Instagram, SoundCloud. I have an album on Spotify and I also have a music website, beatsculptor.com. So all the places. Awesome. Thanks so much for doing this, Dan. This was, this was badass. So super fun. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.